Hello, and welcome to a review of Revolution of 1828, a two-player-only tug-of-war from Stefan Feld. Now, as Sean just mentioned, Revolution of 1828 was designed by one of my all-time favorite game designers, Stefan Feld. Features artwork by Alexander Young and was published here in Canada by Renegade Game Studio. Similar to Gunkimono, which we reviewed last week, this game seems to be out of print, with no longer being listed at all on Renegade's website. Now, despite that, I can still find stock at most online stores, usually at prices under the $30 MSRP. Now, I want to point out that this isn't a typo or a mistake. This isn't the Revolutionary War or the War of 1812. This is about a whole different kind of revolution <laughs> in the United States that took place in 1828. Yeah, there's actually a section of the book that explains why the designers and publishers do feel that it was indeed a revolution. So the people who got over their hesitance to buy the game understand. No yes. one else, but... <laughs> <laughs> now in this game, you are reenacting the 1828 presidential election held by the newly formed Democracy of the United States, where John Quincy Adam and Andrew Jackson's were the candidates. Now, this was a history-making election due to the fact this was the first election to be fought not just at the polls and through voting, but through newspapers and other early media. Though really, except for the fact half the rule book talks about the setting of the game, none of this really matters in what boils down to a two-player tile-drafting tug-of-war where you're battling against your opponent trying to get the most votes, or rather points. Okay, now that we know a bit about Revolution of 1828, what are we looking at component-wise? So the components in this game are serviceable, but to me a little bit too abstracted, and a little too abstract for my taste. Well, it's easy enough to distinguish the 78 election tiles. Those are by, they have unique images on them and colors and they're easy to tell apart. And the artwork on the smear campaign tiles don't actually matter at all. So you don't have to worry about those. The problem are the 24 campaign actions, which are a huge part of the gameplay and only feature artwork on them with no indication of what they do while playing. While I understand this was done to help tie that theme in a bit more, I would have much preferred simple iconography that just tells me what the tile does, not what it's supposed to represent historically. The reference pages are a must, unless mm -hmm. you play this game often enough to have memorized them from repetition. Now, that said, the quality of the components is good. Um, nice, thick cardboard, well-punched. It's a mounted board that's very functional, fits in a small box, which is nice. There are wooden meeple. Um, there's a nice bag to pull the tiles from and a good selection of vote counters in different denominations, as well as a very clear rule book that, as mentioned above, is at least half filled with historical notes and references explaining who and what all these historical figures and events that they're giving me instead of icons are what they are and why they matter. The components and pasted on theme is a bit worrisome, yeah. but let's move on to the actual gameplay. Yeah, here's where things start to really turn around for Revolution of 1828 for me. You set up the game by placing all of the round tiles in the bag and mixing them up good. You then draw and place three tiles from the bag on each of the six areas of the main board, which is pretty much just a strip of a bunch of rectangles divided into six different areas. Five are different campaign areas, and the fifth is the press. Now, in the center of each one, you place one of those meeples, the elector figures, when the editor is one, and then it's the electors for the other areas. And that's it. That's how you set it up. It takes seconds. I have to say, looking at the game on the table, set up, mm -hmm. ready to play, still doesn't fill you with an eagerness to play. <laughs> at this point, I was personally still mighty hesitant and wasn't sure I didn't want to just walk away from this game and its odd theme. So the player who filled the board goes first, and they're going to select one and only one of the tiles from the board. If it's one of the delegates, they place it on their side of the board under the matching campaign area. If it's a smear campaign, that acts as a wild card and can be placed under any campaign area. Now, if it's a campaign action tile, they get to do the action that's on the tile. Well, the action that's on the reference sheet, because the tiles don't really tell you anything. 
Now, the campaign actions are actually the most complicated aspect of the game. There's seven different types, and they do things like making your opponent draft from a specific part of the board, or drafting twice, getting a second turn, letting you move tiles from one campaign area to another, taking delegates from your opponents, and so on. The This is the, the meatiest part of the game, and I don't think it's worth getting into here on this podcast. But I will say, overall, they basically let you mess with the board or the other player. Now, almost immediately, once you start playing, you start to see the fun, the challenge, and the strategy. You still don't care about the theme, but the game suddenly becomes interesting. Now, after you draft a tile, if it's the last tile in that area, you get to take the elector or the, the editor. Again, you're taking the meeple, putting it on your side of the board. Having electors is good. Having the editor is bad. That means the press caught you caught the press's attention that year. Now, assuming the meeple you just took wasn't disabled due to one of those campaign tiles, you then get to take another turn. Now, in this way, you can end up with a chain effect happening, either letting you or your opponent draft multiple times by emptying multiple areas on the turn. And there's a big race around getting it so that who has to take the last tile in each area. Now, no, taking a bunch of tiles and turns in a row could be a good thing or a bad thing. Setting up chains of actions when possible is the true delight of this game. Playing that balance of how much to set up and risking your letting your opponent grab the sequence instead of you. It's now once the fi final tiles drafted, the round ends and you enter a scoring phase. Here you're going to get points in the form of votes, with the first three being awarded to the player who has the most campaign actions in front of them. I guess this is somewhat thematic because it's whoever spent the most time campaigning will get some bonus votes. You then resolve each of those five campaign areas one at a time. Now, this is a really simple area majority scoring system. The person with the most tokens on their side wins the vote. If there's no opposition, the opponent has no tiles on their side. You get two votes. If there is opposition, they get one. Ties, no one gets any votes. Then the player with the elector meeple, though, gets one point per tile they've collected on their side whether they had the majority or want or not, or even want a vote. So due to this, it's possible to actually lose a riding, but get more votes due to controlling the elector. Again, I think actually kind of ties in the theme a little bit there. Now, once you've scored each campaign area, then you got to resolve the press. Both players gather up all the smear campaigns on their side of the board. Remember, these were wild cards. They could have put it into any riding. They're going to take them and stack them in the press area. Then the player who has the editor on their side loses a number of votes equal to the smear campaigns they collected. Super easy to count things up and come up with the score for the round. Now, at the end of the round, after collecting all votes, players clear everything from their side of the board except any smear campaigns they have. Those actually build up round after round. You then play through three more rounds, following the exact same rules as above, so that each player places the tiles and gets to go twice. After that, player who's got the most votes wins. All right. Well, now with the gameplay covered, it's time to share some final thoughts on Revolution of 1828. So first off, I think we both totally agree here that as Canadians, this theme does nothing, nothing for us at all. Uh, honestly, it turns me off. Like this is a game that I would shy away from had I'd seen it on a store shelf. Had I not gotten a copy of this game along with a bunch of other games and a big board game sale on Facebook, I would have never given it a look. 100%. I would not glance twice at this game on a shelf. And I would seriously question, before having played it, to those who might recommend it to me. <laughs> well, I hope not everyone's doing that right now. Um, well, I'm sure there are people out there that will appreciate this theme. And there are some mechanics in there that kind of fit the theme, I guess. So it's not like Gunkamono level of abstraction. I can say the theme doesn't actually matter. And that's good because despite being a theme I don't care for at all, the gameplay is solid, like really solid. Yeah, the, the game is probably the most outside of the box, shockingly good game I've personally ever come across. Uh, looking at the box, sitting there on the shelf, it's a two. After playing it once, it's a solid 7-5. Yeah, I, I might even go up to 8 on this one for, for final ranking. Now, I do have to credit Mr. Feld for his work here, right? Now, I'll admit, when I first opened the game and started reading through, uh, for one, I saw the thick rule book, and I was like, well, it's a Feld, it'll be a point salad. Well, it ends up there's only like four pages of rules. And I was worried I finally found the, the exception to the rule, right? I thought I might have found a Stefan Feld game that I wouldn't like. It just sounded too simple. 
But then we gave it a shot and it was Deanna and I, and it was one of our date night charcuterie craft beer gaming nights. And it was a huge hit. And it's not often Deanna's not doesn't love, despite being with me, who's always pushing her to play new games, doesn't really love learning new games. And it's not often she'll ask to play a brand new game twice in a row. And while this one, we played three times in a row, not three rounds, three full complete games. Later, when Sean was down in town, I'm like, you totally got to try this game. It's got the driest, most uninteresting theme ever, but it's so good. And Sean's like, oh, I don't know. Isn't there something else we can play? But what'd you think when you finally got to try it? You know, you were right. And while I play just about anything once, I was not eager, even as I watched <laughs> you set it up. But if someone asked me to play now, I can't think of why I would say no. Now, maybe I say it too often. I, I feel like it's like one of my catchphrases, but I like the way this game makes me think. You really have to try to plan ahead, both in what you're going to draft, as well as predicting what your opponents are going to grab and knowing what those cards do and where you're going to move things. And I got to say, this gets much more intense near the end of the round when you're trying to figure out just how to combo your grabs to get the most tokens while trying to force your opponent to take stuff they don't need or don't want. Like you can totally do it the other way where you force your opponent take seven smear campaigns. Well, I don't think you can get seven, but take three or four smear campaigns in one turn when they've got the press on their side. That's a brilliant move to figure out. Yeah, I think this one, the thinky part is so well balanced by the speed of the game. Yeah, there just isn't a lot to it. And yet it gives you a lot to work with and plan yeah. about. Yeah, the smear campaigns in particular, right? The timing of who gets the editor meeple can be a huge part of this. Like having wildcard tokens you can place anywhere can be in huge points, especially if you can get an unopposed win with an elector on your side. And every token you pile in there is another vote. But as noted above, winning a campaign area doesn't necessarily mean you get the most votes. So that's kind of interesting there too. But collect too many spear campaigns and you risk your opponent making damn sure you get that editor at the end of the round, which by the fourth round of the game, there's usually a huge pile on both sides of the board, making all that extra jockeying for votes earlier mean nothing. Now, one big thing I did note as a downsize to all this planning is a significant amount of AP or analysis paralysis. This is a thinky game. And it's not a, this is, this is not like a quick playing, make your move, make your move, two player romp. Both players are probably going to spend a lot of time planning out their moves and doing the math to figure out the best order to draft things and figuring out how to disrupt their opponent's plans. You're going to sit there and I've seen people playing this, counting on their figures going, okay, I take one, you take one, I take one, then I'm going to use this and get a bonus and you take one, right? Despite not looking like a chess game or feeling like a chess game or having chess-like mechanics, this game to me has a very chess-like brain space. It very much feels like a chess match against your opponent. Indeed. While the move tree is nowhere as deep as chess, no. there is still plenty to consider, especially with that tech take an extra move mechanic and mm -hmm. the eagerness to try and string out as many actions as you can. Overall, we've all been enjoying Revolution of 1828 way more than we ever expected to. This game was a huge surprise to me, and I'm so glad I gave it a shot in the first place. This was a game I didn't have any interest at all that turned out to be a fantastic two-player tug-of-war that even features the small footprint that Deanna and I love, which makes it a great date night game and a game for playing at pubs or cafes. Now, this is another one that with like a rolled-up mat could take up even less space. Not that yeah. it's a big box. Even then, you don't even need a board, really. You just put the meatballs out and lay the three tiles next to them. Now, the fact this great game is out of print right now, I think is a really good indication that we're not the only gamers out there that just passed this one by. And that's a shame. Revolution is now on our personal list of great best two player games. And I expect to keep playing this along with classics like the Duke, Onitama and Patchwork. If you're looking for a brainy, high strategy two player game that's pretty easy to learn, as long as you keep that reference side of the rule book face up, I don't think you'll go wrong with the Revolution of 1828. Just do not judge a book by its cover. Find someone who has it. Find a store to demo it. Buy the game, not the theme. <laughs> now, if you're an American history buff, I, I guess this one would be a no-brainer. 
not only do you get to play out in an infamous election, you get lots of behind the scenes information. And unlike us, you probably care what each of those smeared campaign tokens actually mean. I can also see this being popular with educators, especially in the US, giving you the ability to use the game as a tool to teach a pretty heavy and divisive subject. Maybe. Even after multiple plays as a Canadian, I still don't care about the theme. I just enjoy the strategy. Yeah, maybe it'll give someone some true-false answer questions they might be able to get right. Now, if you don't like two-player-only games or games that, while easy to learn, require a bit of concentration and planning, this one probably isn't for you. The big thing here, though, the, the, the big thing that I hope everyone gets is just don't let the theme scare you away. The fact it's about a U.S. election is the least interesting part of Revolution of 1828. Well, that's it for our thoughts on Revolution of 1828, a great two-player tile-drafting area majority game that also happens to be about a famous U.S. election. Now, what's the last game you played where you were turned off by the theme but ended up loving the game despite it? Tell us about it in the comments below. Also, I invite you to check out my written review of Revolution of 1828 on the Tabletop Bellhop blog, where I get into a little more detail about things like the campaign actions and exactly what they let you do, as well as offer up plenty of pictures from our gameplays.